Uh, let, let me say on, you know, uh, on behalf of the Wolf Humanity Center and the Kelly Writers House, I would like to welcome everyone here in the room and also all of y'all uh, uh, virtually tuning in. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dagmawi Wupshet. I am the uh, Ahuja Family Presidential, it's a long title, Associate <laughs> Professor of English here at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, also the uh, topic director for the Wolf Humanity Center, uh, the Center's Forum on Migration this year. So before I introduce our guest, the uh, inimitable uh, <laughs> Lyrae Van Cleef Stefana, let me just offer my immense gratitude to the people who've made this event possible. Uh, of course, my colleagues at the Wolf Humanity Center, uh, 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 Jamal Elias, unfortunately he couldn't join us today, but the Associate Director, uh, uh, Sarah Varney, Sarah Milinsky, uh, Pamela Horn is also here, uh, and Ishani Dasgupta, and also colleagues at the Kelly Writers House, spe especially uh, uh, Jessica Lowenthal, who from the very start, which was I think two years, three years ago when we were be beginning to curate the series of events for the year, was super supportive and in enthusiastic to collaborate uh, with the Wolf Center and realizing the Forum on Migration. So thank you, everyone. Now, as some of you may know, uh, this academic year, the annual theme for the Wolf Humanities Center has been migration. And we've held a year-long series of public events featuring musicians, writers, artists, curators, scholars, community leaders, public officials, indeed a diversity of critical voices and perspectives to help us understand one of the most important issues of our time and an issue that is just in glaring relief given the war in Ukraine. Um, so our conversation today, art, lyric, and movement is the kind of penultimate event in, this, in, uh, in the series. Uh, uh, we have another event this, this evening, a poetry reading scheduled uh, from 5 to 6.30 p.m. It will be in the Kislak Center for Special Collections and will feature Lai Ray uh, um, and also Penn professors, poets, Ahmad Almala, Herman Beavers, and Fatima Sham. So hopefully you can join us for that. Um, all right, so what a joyous uh, occasion to, uh, to be here next to Lai Ray and to introduce her. Uh, Ray is one of the most, Lai Ray Van Cleef Stefan is one of the most gifted poets I know. Just to give you the official uh, 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 bio, she is the author of Open Interval, a 2009 finalist for the National Book Award and LA Times Book Prize. And her first collection, Black Swan, winner of the 2001 Kave Khan and Poetry Prize. As well as the chapbook, two different chapbooks, Leading with a Naked Body, uh, authored with Leela Chantrell and uh, Poems in Conversation in a Conversation with the Poet Elizabeth Alexander. A poet with an arsenal of talent, Lyrae has also written plays and lyrics for the Cherry and Ithaca Arts Collective, um, um, and the fight for political uh, equality, and, and I'm sorry, pardon me, and in 2018, her work was featured uh, in, in a show called Courage Everywhere, uh, which celebrated women's uh, suffrage and the fight for political equality at the National Theatre in London. Um, she's been awarded fellowships from the Kavi, from Kavi Kanem, the Lannan Foundation, and Civitella Ranieri, among others, and her work has appeared in various journals, including Callaloo, Crab Orchard Review, Shenandoah, and anthologies like uh, Bumrush the Page, Gathering Ground, uh, The Ringing Ear, Black Poets Lean South, and Angles of Ascent, Norton Anthology of Contemporary African American Poetry. She is currently at work on Coal Tar Colors, which is the title of her third collection of poems, which will include the poems she'll read for us and we'll talk about today, uh, and also a series of essays purchase, uh, a collection of uh, personal essays. She is Associate Professor of English at Cornell University. Now, I would be remiss not to mention from 2006 to 2017, Ray and I were colleagues at, at, at Cornell, and I saw firsthand the grace, generosity, and fierce intelligence with which she carried out her vocation as an artist and a teacher. Moreover, over the 15 years 
we've come to forge a deep, deep friendship. She is my bestie. A rare bond that's taught me that the root of friendship is freedom and love. Lyra is an extraordinary person as she is an extraordinary poet. Why I am so thrilled to be sitting next to her conducting this conversation. So please help me uh, um, welcome, extend a very warm welcome to Lyra Van Cleef Stavannik. Hi, Ray. Thank you, Mahara. <laughs> All right. So, you know, I have, a, the hour is going to go like that, but I have a series of um, questions. So, just to set up mm -hmm. before you read the poem for us. Um, um, so, Lyra, um, um, I mean, we're going to start with the MoMA exhibition. So Museum of Modern Art in New York did a, a landmark exhibition in 2015 called One Way Ticket Jacob Lawrence Migration Series, right? So you can't see all 60 panels, right? Uh, so just to remind people, Jacob Lawrence, of course, one of the most important American painters of the 20th century, and his migration series is his most celebrated work. The series, which uh, he completed in 1941, features 60 individual panels that depict the Great Migration, that mass movement of African Americans from the rural South to the urban centers in the North, Midwest, and Western parts of the US in the first half of the 20th century. All 60 panels, so the, the Whitney owns half, the Phillips Collection in Washington DC owns half, so all 60 panels have rarely been exhibited together. So the 2050 MoMA exhibition was significant for that reason, and moreover, the series of events that accompanied the exhibition, including commissioning 10 leading major African-American poets to write after uh, uh, Lawrence's uh, 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 series. So, Ray, you are one of the 10 poets commissioned to write a poem, right? Um, so with that preamble, can I ask you to read the poem, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into the conversation. So I, if you don't mind, I'm going to project the poem so they could see oh, okay. all that you do on the page, right? Can you all hear me? It's good. Okay. Thanks for having me. My heart. Hey. This is Migration, and it has um, two epigraphs. The first from Jacob Lawrence, who says, if I see something happening, which I like, I let it happen. And the second, if it's love flowing freely, I'm ready. Tracy Chapman. Migration. Black is an ardor. Color moving as wholeness. Yellow migrates blouse to light, handle to bell. Green migrates button to satchel to wall. Blue migrates coat to sea to night. Sky finds an order. Black is an ardor of smokestack, cirrus, bird flight, blanket, bowl stem, against spike head, slipper, judge robe, noose rope, hair. Fat back carved on a table is a block of pink stripes falling open as a story's pages about to be sliced and served. Please pass me the last bit of summer, August green, glide into overlays of gold, shivers of goldenrod borders against assuring sun gilt pawn. Here I sit. See if you can't find Jacob's process in the snake anxious way I crossed the grass to get at shade. I'm still southern in the silver gray whisper underleaf the breeze brings up. Green is a table upon which that narrative of pig and hunger sits until green is the sky at the top of a labor camp stairwell holding the moon, or is green the door, the yellow moon, a large bright knob to turn to exit these quarters. If yellow is a question of travel, of red, of orange alerts, key suddenly something from the bottom of the pond, something as simple as caution or coy. At first, one giant, one, then the vibrancy beneath the surface splits 
its 40 fish making that orange glide, divide. I realize, and one flips its silver-bellied self out of the water, praise, recognition, belied. I'm dying to say each soul almost isosceles in her flare, in his onward press, slants in slant rhyme to Mississippi's mouse. If I'm lying, I'm dying to count every dropped leaf, every spent petal toward black potential. Say prehistoric swamp heat, black process burns, a fossil fuel. Say peat to make a seam, the total black peeling outside St. Louis all week beneath a hard blue repetition. Young black men dealt death unseemly. What's true about a man at 23? He's gone to books in fall, to studio in spring, gassoing boards with Gwendolyn, with whiting and rabbit skin glue to keep the fibers of a story in his head set when it's cooled and dried. He moves to set its rhythms to a palette, set its tones in casein colors, what it means to move, prepare, then let the living thing beneath a scene still breathing breathe as memory does alive beneath the egg and milk and pigment four hours in the street one body lies between dimensions jacob's north whose figment the panels draw him south he flies write about movement where it is most still black is arduous in riot, a raised baton in burning building, what's behind the cracked window. The SWAT van that appeared suddenly and sat for 20 minutes outside your house drove you from porch to pond. You wondered where a sister might find some peace, though you know you never use the word sister like that. You wrote where I, sister, might find some peace and then revised it. You're telling the truth, a correction. The I in you corrects. It rises like something from the deep. You're not even at the pond anymore, but still you want to feel outside like you want to write. Rise, overrun, like water. You're in a rush to work, some delta in if you're me. Dirt moves you. In music, the dirty rides you further into this writing. Prof you are, the proof is in the plies. Though it's hard to admit how his what that mean tickles your that means you recognize. What you do to me, baby, it never gets out of me. You want him in the picture, so write him to, through. Jacob's rose, like flames of green crops, streak, squash, blossom, color, stripes, dirt, go with your ratchet. Negro, who had been part of the soil, now going into and living a new life in the urban centers, go with what moves you. What you do to me, baby, it never gets out of me. Reaching two, three, four, pigtailed black girls at a chalkboard stretch, reach, mark this black, river this, black is an ardor from soil, summer, scent of slate, scratched up, rock with what moves, black bodies, what you do to me baby is beyond, chalk borders freely filling, it's it, it's black, black, fully, free, it never gets out of me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, all right. So, um, before I ask the the first question, Ray. Um, so, the what I find so striking about your poem, right, is your fidelity to Lawrence's process. 
So the way Lawrence composed these 60 panels is that he worked on them simultaneously, not a panel at a time, but at the same time, right? He sketched images and scenes with a pencil, then filled in his sketches with a limited range of color, working with only one color at a time and applying it panel, like black here, and then continuing that, right? Blue, the same kind of process. And in fact, he says, I quote him, I had a very simple palette. I went through all the panels painting yellows, greens, and blues. So they're all the same. I didn't mix color. I left it pure as it was because I wanted the series to be a unit. I consider it one work, not 60 works, unquote. So what I find so moving about your poems is that not only do several of the panels figure in, 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 in the uh, poem, but you attend to the very process of how he used color, right? How color migrates from panel to panel. And of the 10, I mean, the of the other poets who were commissioned, including some of my favorite poets, like, you know, uh, uh, Terence Hayes, Rita Dove, Natasha Trethewey, they focus on a single panel, but you chose to heed the process and not the product. So can you say more about that? Fidelity to process. Um, I, I wind up doing things the only way that I know how to do them, that I can do a thing. And so um, that whole idea of the panels all across being all filled with just the black was so interesting to me. Like, what would you see if you were, you were making all of these and looked and only saw the black, you know, as it was being made? Mm -hmm. And I just thought, okay, that's that, Everything makes me think of emergence, <laughs> really, to be honest. But it really made me think about the emergent. And so that was the thing that was then driving me in the poem, where it's just like, where are these places where from abstraction, like mm -hmm. the representational emerges, or where are these places from like this moment, like another moment emerges. I love the poem, poem's ability to, to make, the, um, a poem's ability to make that happen. Mm. And to make it happen across time is one of the things that I'm always like trying to make a poem that'll do that so that then I get a surprise too when I'm reading the poem today and I get against spike head, slipper, judge robe, noose rope, hair. I'm seeing the news from today in my own poem emerging, you know, and it's just like, I'm always trying to like make a thing that'll do that. Um, how do I make it do that? You know, how do I keep like the representational in there, but like have the abstraction, like do what it does so that then I can open up portals in a poem you know, so that like whatever is being talked about in the moment has space to come through. Mm. Um, yeah. So this is not the first ecrastic poem that you've written, right? But to me, it is so it's singular in your corpus, right? So ecrast, you know, for some of us new to uh, ecrastic poetry, generic definition meaning like a poem after a work of art, right? Uh, so Ray has written a few. But what's unique about this particular poem is the way in which both form and subject cohere or aligned. So uh, ecrastic poetry there entails, intrinsic to it, is this movement from one form, visual art, to poem, right? And then, of course, you're writing about migration. So form and theme are so intertwined. That's one. And then the other thing is, some of you who know Lyrae's poetry, you know, this poem, she's moving. I mean, there's so much movement, right, on, on, on the page. Uh, it's, we see it. We see the dance. We see the movement on the page. And that's new, at least the work that, that had come to date, that preceded the, the composition of this poem. So I'm wondering... Um, uh, the question is, that I want to ask is, um, you know, in, in, in writing, in, in working on this poem, just what you've learned about maybe ecrastic poetry, about lyric space, white space and movement, 
color and movement, you know, because having now I have a big, this is the advantage of being uh, a bestie. I've read many of the poems that are going to appear in cult tar colors, right? So this poem seemed to open up a different kind of space for you. So just reflect on that. Uh, ekphrastic poems are so interesting to me because it's like the whole idea of describing a thing like of, of description but the poem has to be able to stand up by itself if somebody is not looking at at whatever mm. the whatever piece of art the poem is in conversation with and how do I make that happen and still keep you know that whole notion of of movement through it and then um what i learned is is um so much about process in in nature mm -hmm. you know um one of the things that i became obsessed with um thinking about migration and and is um this thing that's happening with with swallowtails but like like thinking about like you're moving from the one piece of art into the next mm. piece of art swallowtail um butterflies mm. um when you go from that caterpillar to that butterfly that um what do you call the thing in the middle um the the, the chrysalis um <laughs> yes. swallowtails if you've never looked this up that looks like a snake's head that so so part of the snake anxious um, thing like so and it's becoming more and more and more pronounced um it's be, like they're getting more they they look more and more like a snake and more and more like including things like this little thing that comes out that looks like a snake's tongue and stuff like that and so it's like that idea that to move from caterpillar to butterfly that one would become a snake mm. was like such a fascinating thing to me to try and work with in terms of how the poems move mm. and what structures or what forms will hold i was saying to dag earlier that my favorite part of this poem because people like who've read my work know that I'm obsessed with a sonnet. I love a sonnet, um, but like the sonnet as a form refusing and the sonnet as um, the little box of authority that sometimes people have written themselves into. And I've seen like kind of black authors write yourself into this little box of authority and what a sonnet, what that little box can and cannot hold. And this was like one of the first times in this poem where I got that movement towards like trying to get into that that box on the page and that refusal, like it will not hold you know hmm. that that little box cannot hold Mike Brown and it cannot hold the process of what Jacob Lawrence is doing hmm. in this thing and so it's like trying to come together not quite and like being able to to have that happen on the page and that like in a um, in open interval it's just via the bonds that hmm. that kind of atomizing is happening but now it's like via the white space too like that notion of like what's true trying to come in and attach itself mm. and that truth like being like blocked from that attachment by that white white space it can't it can't can't contain it can't con the box can't contain but also that truth can't bridge that white mm. spray that white space and so things like that mm -hmm. when i'm wor working on this poem like that's the kind of stuff that i was learning or like the way that the green table like stair steps mm -hmm. um because of the way that lawrence has in the panel that moon at the top of the camp um at the top of the uh camp if you want to look at it like that but then there's so many different possibilities for perspective and ways of reading the panels you know and like kind of what you see as opposed to what I see when I'm making it, so that. it's it's actually let me go back. You, it's you, what you do with the sonnet here reminds me of the first poem, an open interval, Bach the North Star. One of my favorite lines of yours in general, but in that poem is, "Teach the sonnet is As a, a cell. cell. Now, now try, try to, to escape." escape. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, say more about. I mean, because on the one hand, you clearly. You're such a formalist, mm -hmm. and then you also, 
if, th if this is your first encounter with Lyrae's poetry, you, s you experiment, right? So that tension of received form and then like how to bust it open, mm -hmm. right? Or what to do with that. And it's almost in this poem, you are heeding that imperative from Bob North Star mm -hmm. of teach the sonnet is a cell, now try to escape. Yeah, and Bob, the Bop and the sonnet are always in conversation for me. So both in this poem where we end with a Bop and have this, this sonnet refusing in here but in, or in that poem that is a bop but that like addresses the sonnet in it that that poem um grew from my experiences um teaching i used to teach um at a um as part of the cornell prison Ed education program at the maximum security men's prison at auburn and um in order to get to that prison at auburn you have to pass Harriet Tubman's house. Like, and so all of, I would think of all of Harriet Tubman's trips, you know, back and forth to get people on the Underground Railroad and this notion of uh, freedom having a site, you know, and then to drive past that site in the space where we're supposed to be free and then to go into that prison and teach those workshops that were primarily full of black men was just a thing that was devastating. Like, how do I even like kind of reconcile this? Mm -hmm. um, and that Auburn is the place where, when you think about prisons and prisoners in striped uniforms and stuff like that, that is that was started at Auburn. But also this notion of like, like oh, the prisoners are gonna sit and reflect on what you've done, and so like everybody was in these isolated. And so these cells, and, and um, in order to teach that class, I would have to walk through the yard at Auburn. And so there's this open space of like walking through the yard with like, um, with other people who were teaching there and stuff like that and, and being surrounded by these cells and like people um, shouting, you know, whatever they would be shouting you know, and thinking about, well, what are those cells? Because it's just like a cruelty to be in isolation, you know, like that. And, and so trying to like work that all out mm. um, in that same way of thinking about, you know, I'm always thinking about Phyllis Wheatley. I'm mm. always thinking about the ways in which her story is written into the stories of this nation um, about, you know, her formalism and stuff like that about how people like think that oh she can write a sonnet well okay well then we'll take that as a like a real you can really write a, a poem if you can write a, a sonnet that little box of authority mm. I resent it mm. I resent that little box of authority mm. at the same time that I find a sonnet so beautiful of course. but I never write a straight sonnet yeah I can't write a straight I, like they're never straight Right, right, right. Uh, okay, so to come back to all that you do with the, so again, this is for me kind of signature lyrate, right? Like the poem becomes, so for instance, in an open interval, it's a portal and you use your name lyrate, meaning of lyric poetry, mm -hmm. but also the RR lyrate uh, variable pulsating star, mm -hmm. and you use that to you know, as a kind of portal to to time travel, mm -hmm. to here we are kind of, you know, we're grounded here on earth and then all of a sudden we are in a, in a different sphere, mm -hmm. to, to move between the historical and, you know, the contemporary, between the, the personal, the mythological, the political, all that kind of overlapping. And reading this poem, we, you know, it, it's funny, reading it again, that reference to Michael Brown's killing. It took me a while, because the reference is so subtle until the, uh, so let me just uh, uh, bring it up. Um, you say something about near St. Louis, mm -hmm. right? And then you talk about his body just lying in the lying street for four street, hours. Right? So it's a poem about Jacob Lawrence migration, but then, it's what you were saying earlier. Here is uh, a major an incident, right? Uh, of from gleaned from when you were writing the poem, mm -hmm. and also the SWAT car sitting in front. What the what 
lyric does for you, like how you, it becomes a portal to collapse these boundaries or move across boundaries. I wonder if you could say something more about that. I steal from people all the time who teach me things. I was looking, I was hoping that there might be a copy of um, Rita Dove's Thomas and Beulah um, in here because when I was thinking, when I'm thinking about how to travel and not just across panels, which is, okay, things might get weird because I start talking about how the way my brain works and people get scared, but like um, traveling across the panels is like kind of one thing but then the traveling through, like how do I get that to happen? And for me, I needed to get a way to get those drops through time. Um, like where's the, where's the first one and how do I get it? And it's through the water, as if you know, you'll notice, like through the water. And so that shuring, the shuring is like a thing like that nobody will know unless I tell them. But for me, it's a tool. And that's um, from um, when Lim jumps into you know he thinks it's a there's that there's land there to told him you all know what i'm talking about in that poem in thomas and beulah and um there's two best friends and they're out together and the one is the the one is going to become a musician it's like the thing that makes him a blues musician is he's out with his best friends his best friend says them's chestnuts i believe and goes to like get the chestnuts and then falls through the water and then he's he's gone he's never seen again he dies but also thinking about okay how do i move via that blackness and everything like that like um um if you know how coal is made, like the part of the thing, part of the thing that's happening in the poem is like that sediment mm -hmm. of every every leaf, everything to black potential. Like peat is how coal is made. Mm -hmm. So that's how you get that blackness that then people mine for fuel and stuff. Is that all of this different material like settling on top of each other and on top of each other and like getting compressed and eventually like kind of turning to coal but that's just like natural material that does that mm -hmm. and so like but i also am from florida which also runs through mm -hmm. and the swamp is the ultimate archive the swamp holds everything mm -hmm. like the swamp just keeps things you know and so that as a thing that's all like kind of working together as a system to hold the poem together. I know that it has to, I know how that it has to work on a layer of sound and I know that it has to work on a layer of image and I know it has to work on a layer of description, hmm. but I have to make the other systems work hmm. for me hmm. and like I've learned how to make those other systems work so that then there's space in the gaps for for that to work both ways. Am I making sense to y'all? <laughs> for for there so that there's yes. space in the gap so that like Katanji Brown and alopecia and everything that's on the like can can also yes. come this way. Mm -hmm. Like it's going that way where I'm like driving where I'm diving through, but also there's a possibility for other things to to come through. Mm -hmm. So we talked about it as a kind of ekphrastic poem, but it's all the songs, right? So you mm -hmm. begin with the Tracy Chapman uh, epigram, but yes. then there is uh, Plies, <laughs> right? The Florida rapper. Uh, there's also the the uh, blues singer in reference to Gishi Wiley, yes. right? the blues singer and musician. Do you want to say? Because uh, it, this is another of like a signature move of yours, right? Of, just blurring all these hierarchies, right? So like where in your poems, the way in which what we can say high and low or whatever in the vernacular are always complementary. There's no hierarchy, right? Uh, but I, I see song in the vernacular uh, doing a similar thing here. Yeah. The, the Gishi Wiley, so the, the bop form that Afa Michael Weaver, um, who was an elder at Kabe Kanam, came up with at Kabe Kanam, and I think it's like the perfect form, um, includes in the form um, a refrain that is either like some bit of black speech or, or, or fragment from a song or like verse or something like that. And so that um, refrain 
um, is from Gishi Wiley's The Last Kind Words, um, a blues song. I can read you the lyrics of that, of that song. Mm -hmm. The last kind words I heard my daddy say, Lord, the last kind words I heard my daddy say, if I die, if I die in the German war, I want you to send my body, send it to my mother, Lord. If I get killed, if I get killed, please don't bury my soul. I prefer just leave me out, let the buzzards eat me whole. When you see me coming, look across the rich man's field. If I don't bring you flour, I'll bring you bolted meal. I went to the depot, looked up at the stars, cried, some train don't come, there'll be some walking done. My mama told me just before she died, Lord precious daughter, don't you be so wild. The Mississippi River, you know it's wide and deep. I can stand right here, see my babe from the other side. What you do to me, baby, it never gets out of me. I may not see you after I cross the deep blue sea. And so like that historical and, yeah. and all of that stuff and everything like that, I come out of a tradition, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It's like I'm doing that in the poem, but it's like Kishi Wiley is doing that mm -hmm. in her blues, mm -hmm. you know? that's. I'm not making anything up. There's nothing that I do that that Phyllis Wheatley wasn't doing, mm -hmm. or, you Miss know, or Miss Lucille Clifton wasn't doing, mm -hmm. or or June Jordan wasn't doing. You know, like I come out of a tradition of of read, and I read women who, in particular, who have I I I've found that lineage mm -hmm. and find comfort in that lineage. Mm -hmm. You know. So that then when somebody looking at me with the side eye, like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And how are you time traveling and stuff like that? I'm like, you, you, okay, go, go and listen to Geechee Wiley sing mm -hmm. or go and read Lucy Clifton or Jim Jordan. You know, it's mm -hmm. all, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Ray, can I, uh, now, I, I have to ask, you know, about punctuation, right? Mm -hmm. So in open interval, you use the, you know, like the language of astronomy and, as I said, and lyric poetry cohere, but you also transform different mathematical notations into punctuation marks, inventing lyric symbols imbued with new conceptual power and representational possibility, right? So, and just what, like, give us a sense of, so what these, the bonds that you do, like, so the M dash colon, and then, this little thing, like the way the sections are divided, mm -hmm. it's the inverted parentheses, but you know, I was trying to come up, I couldn't find it in my simple, whatever, for my notes, but I thought, it looks like an eyelash. Mm. It looks like an eyelash. It's, mm -hmm. It seems so intimate and tender. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because I have long eyelashes, so <laughs> these are my assets. Uh, <laughs> so, but it looks like just, you know, like an eyelash on the page. Oh. Um, um, the, but yeah, your punctuation. The, the, so the bonds, the, the, the M dash and the colon, I call them bonds. And um, I started doing that when I was writing Open Interval because again, it's like the, the thing about the Lawrence that's so interesting to me is like that, the conversation between the representational and the abstract. The more, rep the more like concrete that I try to be mm -hmm. in my poems, the more abstract people think that I'm being. Like those bonds I started making because I'm like, okay, this is like the world that I, as I actually see it. Or if, or if you like look at things in terms of the molecular and how things are made mm -hmm. or how like when we're just walking around, like the sun, the light from the sun is making like molecular reactions happen. Like things get split apart and then be put back together because of the sun. Like that's the thing, that's the universe that we live in. Or it's mm -hmm. like you think about, like I was just talking recently about, I have the sickle cell trait, so I'm an actual mutant. <laughs> you know, and like mutations and how mutations work, or if you think about um, DNA and that, like, kind of, um, um, you know, the 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 unzipping and then like kind of reforming, like that's the way that the world that I live in works, mm -hmm. and you get like these different fragments of things that come together to build a thing, and I want to put that on the page and make that more more visible that like okay this wholeness 
that is that poem, but also this wholeness mm. is like that and is made of all of those those different things. How do I make that more explicit on the page? And the bonds um, were how I started um, playing with doing that. Mm. And then other symbols have just like kind of come through. I like this um, symbol, which like kind of we use like for um, unstressed, but also yeah. like I think about like for me, it was that idea of migration and I wanted like something suggestive of mm. like flight bird something mm. but also suggestive of music mm. and so yeah that was that was that choice okay I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll open it up to to questions um, I'm curious how this poem um, yeah it's just informing uh, the, the, the the collection that you're finishing Cold Talk Colors uh, yeah um, there was a, a there was a a freedom that I found in this poem in mm. making it because that way in which I'm just kind of like you know the, that lyric um, <laughs> precious daughter don't you be so wild and stuff mm. I got this commission I looked at that piece of art I'm trying like my darndest the whole time to like make it because it was gonna you know the the the, the exhibit was going to open and we were going to do this um this reading and and then there was going to be like the catalog mm. i blew the deadline so mm. what's in the catalog is not the poem that it is now there was no way that i could finish that poem mm. you know like because of because i couldn't just do the one panel thing like i just the way my brain works would not let me do it and so it was just like well when the deadline for the catalog came, I was like, here's what I have today. Right. And then when the reading came, I read what I had that day. And <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it was just kind of like um, the freedom to just be like, oh, yes. And this poem throughout my career or my life or like whatever can be moving and being made and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And um, that, I don't know. If yeah. I don't know if you think it, who would think of it as helpful because maybe I need more discipline, but I am like wildly undisciplined. Yes. So, yeah, so that's just, it, it gave me a lot of freedom. I see it. Uh, all right. Uh, any questions from the audience? Oh, we have some time. Uh, um, I can continue, but it would be great to maybe get the audience um, involved. We have about 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes. Questions broad and... Actually, I'm sorry. Do you mind using the mic for uh, folks tuning in virtually? Yeah, what's, um, hello, thank you for coming. Um, what's like typically your process for when you struggle with like writer's block or like kind of a lack of inspiration and have to continue on? Um, Writer's block is not as much a thing for me. Um, it's getting a thing to hold together. Even again, it's like to go back to that to that sonnet. To getting a thing to hold together for long enough for me to say, okay, yeah, I'm gonna put that out in the world right there as it's holding together, you know. And like you know, um, the the two collections did that and I read them and I feel like okay they did that and then this one has been a, a longer time um, in writing it because it shifts so much and it's just like okay how much am I gonna <laughs> like is this the is this the shape and then there's a part of me that resists even that it's gonna be a collection or a book like that and so I've started making an album and setting the poems with a percussionist and some with a bass player and it's just like they're just what is it gonna be what form is it gonna take so that's that's my struggle like if I if I go outside and look at anything <laughs> I'm gonna write a poem <laughs> you know <laughs> or stay inside and look at anything 
everything in the world to me is just like, oh my gosh, this is so fascinating. Like, look at this, and then look at this, and then look at this, and then I get vectors, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it, that, it, it's, the, it's the other thing of just like, okay, when I get to I get vectors, and people are like, you need to simmer down, lady, <laughs> and get this book out. And like, that, that is the, that's the issue for me. Yeah, and, and Ray, I mean, I think about for you, because if I were just to take all the poems you've published since Open Interval, yeah. they would be at least in two volumes, right? So just in terms of how you think about a collection, like many of the poems, actually vast majority of those poems aren't even going to be in the collection, right? So in terms of how you choose what is a collection, because you are so prolific, right? But then the the book is a different thing. Yeah, it's just like how to please the 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 poet side of things, which I don't care for, as opposed to the part of myself that I want to please, which is that I get back there's part where I'm just like, can we talk about what a transformation, like even in this poem, yeah. you know, like, I was just like, okay, simmer down today and don't be like coming in here and saying a bunch of wild stuff. Yeah, but it's like, <laughs> I want to talk about like, okay, what a transformation is to a line and like how, the, yeah, I just like, yeah. Um, and then the aphasia happened. You know, when I'm like really in my element is how I, when I have to write a poem is when I start talking and I get the log jam and I just am like, I can't finish the sentence. And then that's where the poems come from because I'm genuinely so psyched about that stuff, you know, and I can't stop smiling. I'm like, I want to write that all down. And people are like, no one understands you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we do. We do. Yes, Kirsten. Um, I really want to ask you to t say more on Phyllis Wheatley. And yeah. I'll explain why. Um, it, in the early parts of the poem, right? So in that uh, phrase, black is ardor, mm -hmm. I was like, that is so Wheatley. That's basically mm -hmm. plagiarized, so far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and like, um, I, I'm wondering like how you think about Phyllis Wheatley in relation to your own work and how you are thinking about lineage because the, the people that you're citing also are really importantly like, people who cite Wheatley yeah. as they're like, like June Jordan and Lucille Clifton yeah. and Alice Walker, um, which I guess is kind of implied by the Tracy Chapman, but we don't got to talk about that. Um, <laughs> and so I, yeah, I'm just wondering like how we could think about tradition and formalism too, right? Yes. That's a term you use a lot as a place of possibility. I think that people lack that imagination often when they think about Wheatley and, mm -hmm. and her formalism yes, as a I place of possibility. Too. So um, yeah, too. that's a long question. Just but. Be, for, for those of us who don't know who Phyllis Wheatley is. Sure, um, so Phyllis Wheatley, a uh, late 18th century black American poet, uh, first black woman to publish anything in at least British North America, I want to be specific, um, as, as basically a child, like as, a, as an adolescent. Um, does that, suffi yeah, does yeah, that suffice? You, okay, so that no, of course. Like, we love all in the conversation. Today, we love explaining. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, so mm -hmm. twas that intrinsic ardor bit me right. Yes, yes. so like, uh, yeah, you see me. <laughs> we see each other. Um, and that ardor, is so important to me because when people talk about Phyllis Wheatley, okay, Phyllis Wheatley, when you when you talked about open interval and the um, the the open intervals that 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 punctuation gets used in the book, Phyllis Wheatley drew drew me to that because whenever I say Phyllis Wheatley, I wish there was a board in here. Um, I imagine one of those open intervals between those two words because Phyllis was the name of that boat and Wheatley was the name of them people who bought her, mm -hmm. but she was seven. Mm -hmm. Her mama called her something. Mm -hmm. That silence, all my poems come out of. So like it's Phyllis and then there's the one and then Wheatley and there's the one and I'm coming from here. 
Mm-hmm. Like, what did her mama call her? Like, that's uh, I'm obsessed with it. And the fact that that little girl was seven, that little girl was a genius. Like, how do we not like talk about her like that? She was seven. Didn't she publish that book? She's 14. So that's just seven years, Mm. seven years. And then people talk about it in terms of like, um, oh, the Wheatleys, you know, whatever. They could have been like great people who bought children. That's fine with me. (laughs) (laughs) Like, okay, that's fine. But like, that little girl picked up a piece of coal and was writing on their walls. Mm. Somebody told them that's how she winds up getting an education i see that education again like kind of thinking about the 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 sonnet and everything as an attempt at containing something Mm -hmm. that sonnet that teaching that little girl that like oh well we're not gonna let her like kind of sit at the dinner table but like we're gonna teach her and everything like that that's to stop whatever's happening when she's writing on that wall Mm -hmm. i would Hey, anything. That's why I want time travel mm. to mm. go back and see what that little girl is writing on that mm. wall that scares them people so bad mm. that they have to like. Well, we got to give her something to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're gonna continue living here, because mm. we don't know what might happen, mm. is how I think about her. And so, black is an ardor is going to to that was an intrinsic ardor like. What a fierce thing for the, can you imagine? Like even the 14 year old to like come out in those poems and say, twas an intrinsic art or bid me write. Y'all didn't teach me to, what? <laughs> no, it was not you. I picked that coal up, you know? And so to start from there. And then when you talk about like, you know, Miss Lucille, who was one of my mentors, you know, like the reason why every student that I've ever taught has my, um, has my cell phone number is because Miss Lucille gave me her number. And I was like, Miss Lucille, if you give me your number, I'm gonna call you. <laughs> and she was like, I know. And then I'd call her up and she'd answer the phone and be like, hi, Lyra. You know, and so that is everything to me. And then when you were talking, I was thinking about that picture from the archives of the Wheatley celebration where they're singing, mm-hmm. where it's June Jordan, and Lucille Clifton and Alice Walker Audre and, uh, and, and Audre Lorde, Lorde um, singing in that picture. And I'm just like, when I read those poems and the things that I want to do in my poems, on imagination is one of the things that spurred me. And again, this is where it gets weird and a little woo woo to people, but in On Imagination, she starts like writing about. Like she uses that um, that rhetorical device of a denaton, and she's like talking about like spring happening and winter and all of these things, and then she she starts talking about um, roving from star to star and measuring the distances. You do that with Lyrae stars, hmm. and so I started finding places in those in those writer's works Mm. where when I started feeling like a certain kind of a feeling, a kind of a vibration, a kind of an energy, if I dug there, I would find a lyrae. Mm. Mm. I was like, how is that? Huh? (laughs) (laughs) What? (laughs) Like, but this is how we measure those distances. You know, it's like I look at the June Jordan and look in fragments from a parable and she starts talking about absolute flux and stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh, wait, how do we, oh, wait. And so that tracing that lineage just became an obsession and being a part of that lineage and being able to talk about that that in ways that, um, Mm. that, Yeah, being able to to talk freely about that mm. Mm. has become a thing too. Yes. Uh, maybe we can end on a personal question, Ray. Mm-hmm. Um, just your own experience. You're, you're a Florida girl, yeah. right? Um, 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 Crescent City, 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so just your own experience. Um, I don't, you know, if you can, I have my students from my 80s class. I was going to fashion some question that connects to a shout out to our 80s class. But I can't find it because I don't think you moved from Florida oh, until yeah, I gra- the 90s. No, I graduated in 89. Okay, there I it is. I graduated in 89 yes. from <laughs> DeLand High School. Um, yes, and um, and got left Florida for Washington and Lee University. And so got to Washington and Lee when they had just graduated their first class of women. Um in 1989 Mm. and um yeah the bylaws were still set up so that would they were saying that it would always be 60 40 um in terms of um that space so yeah 89 also the 80s um in terms of influencing my work Mm. um two major things happened to influence my work and my trajectory um during the 80s one was the Hazelwood decision that the Supreme Court made. Um, I was the editor of my high school newspaper. um, And while I was the editor, the Hazelwood decision was handed down, which stripped student publications of First Amendment rights Mm -hmm. while I was the editor of the newspaper. And so I wound up in the news (laughs) um, saying, I'm going to continue to cover any subject that I feel pertinent Mm -hmm. to my paper. Like what? You know, like you're going to censor my paper now? And so that was huge to me. Um, And so I chose Washington and Lee because it was the first journalism school um, in the country. And then the second thing that happened, um, Tiananmen, Mm -hmm. um, and seeing the protests on on the television, And so I was a young student journalist. I was watching um, where Kai C was the person who I was obsessed with. Um, um, I, in my 17-year-old and 18-year-old brain, was like, I'm going to interview him, and we are going to fall in love. (laughs) And that is going to be awesome. Like, I I had the biggest crush on where Kai C. So, like, that, that was part of my trajectory too where it's just like my country saying you no longer are covered you don't get to report on what you mm. want to mm. was so perplexing to me and then Tina and then like it was like the, the kids were my age mm. you know and so yeah all right well thank you so much Ray always a joy and just I learned so much from you my god I'm trying to hang sometimes the way Ly Ray thinks it will hit me like a week later oh like the epiphany will come later but always thank you thank you for joining us and thank you all for coming up thank you all